Hey everybody, this is Kyle Thompson. I uh, am hoping that you all have had a wonderful day today. Um, throughout uh, the day, I've had a few people ask me um, about uh, the history of Juneteenth, um, many of them knowing uh, that um, I have a background in um, uh, racial and political tolerance um, and uh, from the University of Kentucky and, and also um, uh, through being a history buff myself. So I thought I, what I would do is I would uh, give a little bit of history with regard to um, where the um, the holiday of Juneteenth came from and, and why there is a celebration on this day. And it's interesting because um, the um, idea of Juneteenth and how it is uh, uh, perceived and celebrated um, has a lot of ties to uh, the, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I think it's important uh, that we celebrate those as well. Uh, the history of Kentucky during the Civil War is uh, different than any other state uh, in the Union. Uh, and because of that, um, we have a unique uh, history that should be um, not only studied, uh, but also revered in, in the uh, perseverance of, uh, of our people. Um, in response to um, President Lincoln's um, April 15, 1861 call, for troops uh, from all states in the Union. Uh, the, the current uh, governor of the uh, state of Kentucky, uh, his name was Beriah McGoffin, uh, the man who McGoffin County is named after, uh, defiantly responded by telegram and saying, I will, not, uh, I will send not a man nor a dollar uh, for the wicked purpose of subduing my sister Southern states. Um, McGoffin was obviously a, a Southerner um, he uh, did, did not believe in um, abolishing slavery, um, but he uh, believed in neutrality and believed that uh, Kentucky should remain neutral. Um, it was that decision by uh, Beriah McGoffin that would uh, ultimately lead to his own end of his political career. Um, in September of 1861, uh, both Union and Confederate troops entered Kentucky for the first time. Um, and and uh, the idea of Kentucky staying neutral essentially um, died at that point. Uh, McGoffin drafted a resolution uh, for the Kentucky State Legislature for uh, both sides' troops to withdraw from the Commonwealth, uh, but that was soundly defeated. It, it wasn't even close. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, the Unionist uh, Legislature uh, passed a similar resolution but demanded that, that the Confederate uh, armies leave Kentucky only. Uh, McGoffin obviously vetoed that uh, resolution, but just like we have right now, the legislature uh, overrode the governor's veto. Following that particular action, the Southern symp sympathizers of the state, including several legislators, um, met at Russellville, Kentucky in November of 1861 to form what they called a provisional uh, Confederate government. Um, on that date, 261 delegates from 61 mostly divided counties within uh, the Commonwealth declared Kentucky's allegiance to the Union null and void, essentially um, becoming traitors to uh, the United States at that time. Um, they uh, designated Bowling Green as the, uh, the capital of the Confederacy for uh, the Kentucky uh, uh, Union state, I mean, a uh, Confederate state. Um, they uh, had a whole new constitution that they drafted and a wealthy planner named George Washington Johnson, who was from uh, Georgetown, was elected as governor of the provisional Confederate government of the now divided state of Kentucky, giving Kentucky two um, uh, governors, uh, elected governors at the exact same time. Would not be the last time that happened in Kentucky history. Kentucky was admitted in, into the Confederacy, believe it or not, on December the 10th, 1861. As the federal troops had defeated the Confederate forces in the western part of the state, uh, mainly where uh, they had declared their capital to be, um, and including uh, the fall of Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, it caused the entire provisional government to, uh, to be forced to operate out of tents um, in the western part of the state. Um, and at that point, they likely believed that the entire uh, hope of the Confederacy and the Commonwealth uh, was gone, um, especially after General Johnston's troops had fled to Tennessee. Uh, 
Thus, in April 1862, uh, Governor Johnson, um, the Confederate Governor Johnson, uh, volunteered to actually serve as uh, an infantryman with uh, Major General John C. Breckinridge's army. Breckinridge, also a Kentuckian and a resident of Frankfurt at one time, at least twice in his life, um, was a former member of the State House. A, he was a U.S. representative, a U.S. senator. He was actually the youngest vice president in the history of the United States at 36 years old and eventually became the Confederate uh, State Secretary of War and was actually the person that convinced uh, Jefferson Davis, to, uh, who also was another Kentuckian, to provide a national surrender of the Confederate States of America eventually in 1865. But back to Confederate Governor Johnson. On April 6th of 1862, Remember, this is the, the, the Confederate governor of the state uh, being a true believer. Um, he found himself uh, fighting the Southern cause um, in a, a uh, small town called Pittsburgh, Tennessee, uh, where the Battle of Shiloh, which some of you may have heard of, um, was fought. Uh, he became separated from Breckenridge's uh, troops. Uh, during the battle, his horse was actually killed and shot from under him. Uh, he then joined the Kentucky 4th Infantry uh, for the Confederacy as a private. And uh, oddly enough, the governor of Kentucky, the Confederate governor of Kentucky, um, on April 7th, 1862, um, was actually shot. And uh, he took two bullets, one to the uh, chest and one to the thigh. He laid in the field for an entire night, um, uh, dying slowly. Um, and he was discovered the next morning by uh, a fellow Freemason uh, by the name of Union Brigadier General Alexander McDowell McCook. Uh, he personally moved into a medical ship. Two days later on April 9th, 1862, Confederate Governor Johnson died of his wounds. Um, it's at this point that uh, you would think that uh, they would think, well, we're not going to elect anybody else, but You'd be wrong. They instead they um, they elected um, a 65-year-old Virginia-born lawyer named Richard Hawes, um, and uh, Richard Hawes took the oath of office as the second and last Confederate governor uh, of Kentucky on May 31st, 1862. On August 16th, 1862, McGoffin, remember McGoffin's still around, remaining a staunch advocate of neutrality um, while also holding strong beliefs in states' rights and also the institution of slavery. Um, and having lost all of his support in the Kentucky legislature because they had all left and formed their own government, um, actually uh, agreed to resign his position. And in doing so, he allowed his own pick, uh, James F. Robinson, uh, to be installed as the governor of the Commonwealth. He had been the Speaker of the House for a total of I think two days before uh, being uh, named the governor, the uh, new union governor of Kentucky. Um, that entire summer, though, uh, multiple Confederate armies had invaded Kentucky in order to pull union troops away from the vital railroad junction of Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, essentially trying to pull um, them away from the battles that were happening down there. In early September, the Southern troops uh, converged on Frankfurt, uh, the state capital. On September 2nd, uh, Unionist Governor James F. Robinson had to actually flee uh, with his cabinet to Louisville um, with many members of the state legislature. Uh, the move to Louisville was actually orderly. They, they had time. They knew that the Confederates were, were coming into town, um, and all the state records and archives were saved uh, from falling into rebel hands, thank goodness. Um, the next day, September 3rd, 1862, uh, Colonel John Scott of the 1st Louisiana Confederate Cavalry reached Frankfort. Scott's men, who had recently participated in the Confederate victory uh, at the Battle of Richmond, Kentucky, placed their regimental flag on top of the old state capitol. And for this uh, fleeting moment, uh, the um, state of Kentucky was under Confederate uh, rule, and the um, state house was controlled by confederates uh, that evening scott rounded up 450 fresh horses and actually attacked troops as they were withdrawing towards louisville um, at sunrise on september 4th uh, colonel scott's men uh, were found uh, fighting small skirmishes near shelbyville kentucky and further the federal troops uh, toward louisville um, and further pushed the federal troops towards louisville 
Scott then returned to Frankfurt, uh, where his horsemen camped on September 6th and 7th, before riding on to Lebanon. For uh, approximately one full month, uh, the Confederates uh, controlled um, the city of Frankfurt. On October the 4th, Confederate General Braxton Braggs and uh, uh, General Edmund Kirby Smith and other notable officers were in Frankfurt with 12,000 Southern troops. Um, and they were there for the inauguration of Richard Hawes as the provisional Confederate governor of Kentucky, the first ever to be able to sit um, in the old capital as the, the governor of Kentucky. In his inaugural remarks, uh, Hawes uh, was, he was blustery kind of guy like most lawyers are. And he said, I assume the duties devolved on me as provincial, as, as provincial governor to give you an opportunity to take your stand and make your choice in, abolition, in, in this abolition war and to decide fully and fairly whether you will cast your destiny with the North or the South. Uh, in his speech on the old Capitol steps, he kept on and he said, the Union cannot be restored and that, emanci and that emancipation would be the most unmitigated curse which could be inflicted on the slave race. And it would actually crush and desolate, he said, the planting states. He also stated that his purpose was to restore our commonwealth to the true basis of constitutional liberty. It sounds like a typical lawyer. The interesting thing was that as he was speaking uh, that that afternoon, just afternoon, uh, federal units had actually come into our artillery range on the hill just to the west of Frankfurt that we now call Ford Hill right up here. And the Confederates, uh, it, it caused uh, Governor Hawes and uh, the Confederates to speed up and conclude uh, the ceremonies and actually withdraw from Frankfurt fleeing towards Versailles in Woodford County. By 4 p.m. that afternoon, Bragg, Smith, and Hawes had all evacuated and fled, forfeiting the scheduled evening events, which the Union soldiers were only too happy to partake of the next day. Because on that night uh, of October the 4th, 1862, the Southerners retreated south, um, and five days later, after uh, the Battle of Perryville, uh, the Confederate forces in Kentucky and the provisional government in Kentucky went into exile again, never to return in the state. And how does this uh, evolve into uh, Juneteenth? This was at the end of 1862. The war was uh, very much still in the balance. Uh, people did not know what was going to happen. Um, and President Lincoln was prepared to make a major impactful statement uh, on the United States and the world, to be honest with you, um, to help swing the tide of the war um, to the Union side. On what is now known as Freedom's Eve, which is the eve of January 1st uh, of 1863, the first watch night services took place across the United States. Um, Lincoln had announced that he would be issuing a proclamation regarding slavery. Did not say what the proclamation would be, um, in the United States the next morning, that being uh, New Year's Day, 1863, just two years into the bloodiest war on our nation's soil. On that night, um, throughout the, uh, the South, enslaved and in the North, free African Americans gathered in churches and in private homes all across our country, awaiting news about this proclamation, something that they didn't believe just five years ago uh, seemed within reach. And on that morning, uh, at the stroke of midnight, all of their prayers were answered as all enslaved people in Confederate states were legally declared free. All northern states had actually abolished slavery by state legislative action um, by 1804. 60 years later, um, almost 60 years later, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, uh, freed those slaves. In Kentucky, um, uh, heeding to the uh, desires of uh, Lincoln to uh, find more soldiers, 23,703 African-American men volunteered to join the Commonwealth's uh, United States Colored Troop Units. This was uh, actually fully one-third of all of the Kentuckians fighting for the Union, um, and uh, those great Kentuckians were ready to fight. Uh, Union soldiers, uh, many of whom were African-American, marched onto plantations and across cities in the South 
reading small copies of the Emancipation Proclamation um, and uh, spreading the news of freedom in each of the Confederate states. But, you know, things don't happen the way um, you want them to. Um, only through the passage of the 13th Amendment, more than two years later, on January 31st, 1865, did emancipation end slavery throughout all of the United States, once and for all. And yet we're still not as to why we celebrate Juneteenth. Not everyone in the Confederate States um, on that January morning in 1863 heard the news that um, all slaves had been freed. And in fact, um, many didn't know for a long time. Even though the Emancipation Proclamation was effective uh, two years previously, uh, it could not be implemented in places still under Confederate control without acquiescence of state governments, which obviously wasn't going to happen. Um, and that didn't happen until April 9th, 1865, when Lee surrendered the Confederate forces to General Ulysses S. Grant at McLean's house in Appomattox, Virginia. On April 7th, just two days before um, he surrendered, uh, General Robert E. Lee, still believing that the war uh, was winnable, um, arrived outside of Appomattox Courthouse. He had 8,000 infantrymen. He was backed up by 18,000 other men as reinforcements um, and cavalry, um, and they were prepared for battle. He was hoping that General Grant's forces had been so depleted through the previous weeks of raiding um, through Western and Northern Virginia that he could kind of steamroll through them and move on to Pennsylvania once again, and then inevitably to Washington, D.C. There were a few minor skirmishes outside the outskirts of town. Less than 200 people were killed. Uh, and Lee realized something very quickly. He was actually surrounded. Um, and that these were not light infantry and cavalry as he had hoped. But the Grant had three different army units totaling 63,285 men that had followed him into Appomattox County. And Lee, perhaps one of the greatest military minds in U.S. history, also determined that he and his 26,000 troops were absolutely outnumbered and surrounded at this point. There was no hope. Lee, looking around to his front, to each of his um, sides and flanks and to his rear, realized that many of the soldiers standing on the front lines at that time were African-American soldiers. Many of those people um, serving on those front lines, those soldiers, they came from Kentucky. They were in Union uniforms and there were over 5,000 African-Americans standing on the front lines of the Union battlefield lines from Kentucky's 109th, 114th, 116th, and 117th units of the U.S. Colored Troops, all present and waiting for General Lee at Appomattox. Lee knew the war was over at this point. He sent two letters with, uh, with messengers to find Grant. He didn't know where Grant was because he was surrounded. Um, one to the front lines and one to the rear flanks. Grant was intercepted just as he was prepared to wipe out the complete rear of Lee's army of Northern Virginia behind a bluff near the courthouse. Grant read the letter from Lee asking for a truce. Grant responded that he would only accept a full military surrender. Lee accepted. Later that day, two sets of armies uh, met outside of the McLean's house. Union soldiers were on the northern side of Main Street and Confederate sides were on the southern side. 25 minutes later, Grant and Lee, who had served actually with each other in the Mexican-American conflict, signed an agreement that provided for unconditional surrender of the armies of the Confederate states. And Grant, ever the man of mercy, after collecting 27,000 rifles, allowed them to retain their sidearms, their baggage, and their horses, so as he would say later, they could make it home safely and plant crops when they got there. The war was now over, he said. It was time to heal. Thus, the war that caused the death of 620,000 men and boys over the fight to end slavery across this nation was effectively over, and the United States became the third nation behind England and the Kingdom of Georgia to end all slavery activities within its borders.
slaveholders. But in the westernmost Confederate state of Texas, enslaved people would not be free until much later. Those same African-American Kentucky units, the 109th, the 114th, the 116th, the 117th, along with added African-American units of the 118th and the 122nd of Kentucky, headed directly to Galveston, Texas, and to Corpus Christi, Texas. And they made sure that freedom was going to be enforced. You see, Texas Confederates had never simply told any African Americans since 1863 that Lincoln had actually freed them, or that the 13th Amendment had ever passed earlier that year in January. So freedom finally came on June 19, 1865, some two months after the war had actually ended, when 2,000 Union troops, mostly from Kentucky, a whole bunch of them from central Kentucky and Frankfurt, arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas. The Army announced that the more than 250,000 enslaved black people in the state were free by executive decree. This day came to be known as Juneteenth by the newly freed people in Texas. As for the brave men in Kentucky, from Kentucky, they remained in the border towns along the Rio Grande until September of 1866. The only monument to these heroes is found within Green Hill Cemetery in Frankfurt, known for two centuries as the Black Cemetery for Kentucky. It was erected amongst great debate when it was announced on Thursday morning of July 3rd, 1925, when the Frankfurt State Journal, the same one, ran the following so, uh, story. Quote, Colored Soldiers Monument to be Unveiled, the monument which has been erected to the memory of the colored soldiers of the Civil War from Frankfurt and Franklin County will be unveiled at the Green Hill Cemetery tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. Short and appropriate exercises are to be held this monument has been erected at a cost of $700 under the direction of the Colored Women's Relief Corps, and each soldier's name has been cut into the stone. Contributions are being made to the fund by patriotic and public-spirited citizens of both races. Kentucky was and remains the only state to recognize the amazing things that African-American troops did to preserve this union and to also spread the news on June 19th, 1865 to the people of Texas. 142 names of Kentucky African-American Civil War soldiers are engraved on that monument. These soldiers were all from the Central Kentucky area. Kentucky historical marker number 2226 at Green Hill Cemetery commemorates the only monument in the Commonwealth that honors African-American Kentuckians who served in the United States colored troops during the American Civil War. So today, if you haven't already, we should consider this an American holiday. We should give it great respect for the men and women who stood up to the evils of slavery and ended a 253 year practice that was designed by the devil himself and ended by the grace of God and the bravery of his followers. And be thankful that we are not one of the 167 countries today that allow for modern slavery and keep 46 million people worldwide in chains. This is and remains the greatest country in the world. And the fact that we are the only country that was willing to spill the blood of our brothers and fellow countrymen to end this practice is proof of that fact. So today, June 19th, 2023, it's not just a black community holiday. It is an American day of pride and patriotism and thankfulness, and we should treat it accordingly. Thank you. Have a great day.